Hey, Addy Hour fam, just want to give a little bit of an introduction to this episode 29, this conversation with Rabbi Angela Bukdal. We're actually releasing it on a different day this week. Just with everything that we've experienced as a society, I'm recording this uh, intro on the 26th of May. And I debated uh, for a while on whether to release the episode this week, whether to give some time just as we've continued to experience tragedy after tragedy with these, uh, with these shootings first. Um, not first, but recently in Buffalo, then again in California, um, in Texas, in the elementary school. Um, and so I debated whether to release this episode because some of the topics that we brought up were also related to that in the sense that Rabbi Bukdal also walked um, a host walked through and helped navigate a hostage situation at a synagogue in Texas in January. And that's something that she talked about on the episode as well. Um, so I just wanted to be sensitive to where we all were as a society, where you all were as listeners. But ultimately, I thought it would still be good to release the episode because there's so many aspects of hope that she also shared in this episode in terms of just things that she has been navigating as a leader, things that she has navigated in her synagogue and in her Jewish community, and I think important lessons for us all. So again, that's the reason that we decided to wait and not release this episode the day after the tragic shooting. Our hearts go out to all those families, not even being able to imagine what it's like to lose a child in that type of setting on such um, an unfortunate circumstance. And in so many ways, obviously, there are lots of policy implications that we could actually do better to try and prevent these things from happening. Um, so with that being said, just wanted to make sure that I put this in context. I hope that you all still will take the time to process and to mourn, to grieve um, as you need to, but also to know that we are here for each other and we need to support each other in this time. And I think that's something you'll definitely get in this episode as well. But again, just wanted to put things in context and to let you all know about that. But I encourage you to listen to the episode. So many important things that we were able to discuss, and I believe that you'll find it cathartic and healing in some ways as well. And I appreciate you all always uh, being here as an Addy Hour family and for everything that you all do to invest in this podcast. Well, welcome to another episode of the Addy Hour. I'm grateful to continue to host these conversations. I will say on the front end, we are operating in a spirit of flexibility today as we've been navigating some technical challenges, but again, it's so important for us to just be flexible in this moment. And something that I've been saying to a lot of people, so it makes sense that I would have to move in that space as well. But again, grateful that you all continue to join in these conversations, actually recording in the Yale podcast studio again today. So thankful for the team and for all they've done to really just help us facilitate these conversations over the last year and a half. Today, I'm honored to be able to welcome Dr. Oh my goodness, Rabbi. That's something <laughs> I've, I've done me. to multiple guests. <laughs> You're not the first, but to introduce Rabbi Angela Bukdal, who is here joining us for a conversation today. So grateful to have you here on the podcast. Grateful to be here. And for today's conversation, it's just going to be an open conversation on a lot of different topics. I haven't assigned a specific title or theme, which is a little bit different for us. But again, I think as you all listen into this conversation, you'll see why that's the case, because there's so many important things that we may touch on as we go through. So just by way of introduction for any who aren't familiar or familiar with, uh, with the rabbi, I just wanted to mention her background a little bit. She serves as a senior rabbi of Central Synagogue in New York City and was his first woman to lead, the first woman to lead Central's Reform Congregation in its 180 year history. So Rabbi Bukdal first joined Central Synagogue as a senior cantor in 2006. And in 2014, she was chosen by the congregation to be the senior rabbi. She was born in Korea to a Jewish American father and a Korean Buddhist mother. Later in life, she earned, attended and earned a bachelor's degree in arts and religious studies from uh, Yale University here on campus. And of course, later became ordained as the first Asian American to be ordained as a cantor or rabbi in North America. So someone who is a pioneer and a trailblazer in a lot of ways. She's been nationally recognized in a lot of different ways and also for her innovations in leading worship. She's been featured in dozens of news outlets, including the Today Show, NPR, and PBS, and was also listed as one of Newsweek's America's 50 Most Influential Rabbis. Angela is someone who also serves on a lot of different uh, organizations and boards on the AGC, also on the New York Board of Rabbis, on the UJA Federation of New York, and on the Yale University President's Council. She's married to her husband, Jacob, and they have three children. So again, someone that I've been introduced to and have had the pleasure of being able to interact with a little bit and really looking forward to the conversation this afternoon. So thanks so much for being here. Me too. 
you left out that I um, was the college roommate of Dr. Esther Chu, who was our point of connection to begin with. And, uh, you know, my claim to fame in the doctor world. <laughs> Maybe that's where, where the doctor part slipped for me. Maybe perhaps, that's what it was. Perhaps yeah. I'm elevating you, but I think, you know, humor aside, there are so many things that you have so much um, influence and impact and as well. So who knows, maybe that's something that will come as an honorary <laughs> at some point in the future, but I'm starting that today. But yes, definitely appreciate that recognition of Dr. Chu uh, connecting the two of us and appreciate her investment in what we're doing here as well. So again, just to start out, as you know, and as my listeners know, I think it's so important for us to have check-ins uh, with each other as we engage in some of these conversations. And especially as, as we're recording at this point in time, um, in the middle of May, the third week of May. Obviously, this has been another challenging week for our country, even as we have been mourning the loss of so many lives, first in Buffalo with a tragic situation there, also in California. And also just acknowledging that a lot of these things are ongoing, even events that don't necessarily hit the national news media in a sense. Um, but at the same time, we have a lot of, of room also for joy as we see people collectively supporting each other in so many different ways as we have reasons for hope. And so with those two things in mind, just want to check in with you and see how you're doing at this point in time with everything that we're navigating through as a society. Um, you know, I think I, I'm feeling what a lot of people in this country are feeling, which is a mix of um, despair and um, deep upset and hurt um, over recent devastating gun violence, racial hatred that we're mm -hmm. seeing, um, you know, Last two weeks ago, the news about the leaked um, decision about abortion in the Supreme Court and where we might be heading with women's rights. And I just, you know, there's a lot that we are very concerned about. And I, I think that it, for me as a person who works in um, the religious field, I think that uh, spiritual resilience, like part of the work now, is that we actually keep up our sense of spiritual resilience to have the will to not give in to that despair. To, to actually believe that and remind ourselves that change is always happening and is continues to be possible change for the better. Um, and that, um, you know, I think that that's, that's where we are right now. And I actually have to keep reminding myself of that mm. message at times. Mm. Really well said. And I, I, I take that to heart as well, even in terms of the, the reminders that we have to give ourselves. How would you say that your, those in your, um, your congregation are also navigating through all this as well? in terms of what you've seen in them and then also in your role as a leader? I think that, I think people are experiencing this on different levels. Some, mm. some are taking it very personally. Some are experiencing it with a great deal of fear and anxiety. Mm. And there are others that have kind of built up a wall and, um, and actually have stopped been able to stop listening to the news, stopped mm. actually caring. I don't know actually what is more frightening. We, mm. we often talk about the fact that indifference is, um, one of the uh, gravest sins because it sort of enables and allows all of this to happen. So I think, you know, I don't, I don't think there's just one response that I'm mm -hmm. seeing. And, uh, you know, I think there's a certain kind of process that people go through when they're grieving something or um, experiencing a, a trauma of some kind that um, some of these things are, are that for people. And, um, and you have to help people move through it to a place that is a little with a little bit more healing, a little more productive, um, a little more hopeful. So I think that's the, that's the task. I appreciate how sensitive it sounds like you are to just all the different places that people are. Um, and even, you know, to take it a step further, I think for many of us, we're also in a lot of those different places at different times. So, yeah. you know, at one moment, it might be for me, you know, trying walking through mourning at another moment, outrage and frustration, sometimes some despair as well, like, oh, this is happening again, or things ever going to get better. And just knowing that there needs to be time and place for all those pieces. And it sounds like you're really empathetic to that and, and cognizant of that as you're in such a, an important leadership role as well. So that's definitely something I appreciate. And mm. I imagine that those um, in your synagogue would appreciate that level of empathy and awareness as well. So just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. So obviously a lot that we're walking through and, and again, just in your role as a leader, a lot that you also often have to carry with you yourself and as you're leading others as well. Um, so I know we'll come back to that in the conversation, but I also wanted to take a step back a little bit as well, because, you know, as I was just mentioning your introduction and your path, there's a lot there. There's a lot of important components there. There's a lot of trailblazing there. Um, and I was just curious if you'd be willing to share with our listeners a little bit about your path and your journey from, you know, 
growing up to come, becoming in this this esteemed role and someone who is is pioneering in so many different ways. How did that journey come about for you? Well, it, so much of this with so much of life is mm. um, a product of uh, some fortunate timing and luck, um, as well as just, you know, I think um, people following a calling if they're able to listen to what they're sort of called to do. And mm. so I certainly never set out as a little kid to think to myself, oh, I want to be a first of anything, honestly, um, mm. or a trailblazer. I, what I was doing was sort of listening to a call that I had from a pretty young age that I was mm. very attuned to sort of the spirit of the universe. Um, mm. And I, I received in many ways, my spiritual, um, sensitivity from my Buddhist mother, mm. but then I received a sort of spiritual and ritual vocabulary from my Jewish father mm. with the Jewish community in which I was raised. So I think that, um, you know, actually Jews, many, many Jews are not actually that comfortable talking about God. Um, mm. It might surprise you. It's not like many other faith traditions in which people very comfortably talk mm. about it, but the vast majority of Jews that are in sort of progressive circles um, at best, you could say that many of them are sort of uncomfortable talking about it. Hmm. But so I think my mother gave me a sense of comfort, not just wow. talking about God, but actually being in conversation with God on a regular hmm. basis. Um, and and then I think, but my but the fact that my father um, and my mother decided that my sister and I would be raised within the Jewish community gave us sort of a, a, a ritual yearly structure for holidays and Shabbat gatherings and meals and um, and biblical stories that sort of informed mm -hmm. the way that I walked through the world. So in some ways, a foundation was set early. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a typical, uh, I'm not a typical path to the rabbinate as like an immigrant from South Korea who comes to America, <laughs> grows True. up in a tiny Jewish community in Tacoma, Washington, and goes on to lead a large synagogue in New York. Very true. <laughs> um, you know, that is an unusual story. But in many ways, part of the luck of this is that I was born in 1972, which was the year that the very first female rabbi was ordained. So mm. it's it's 50 years this year that wow. the first woman was ordained, which in the scope of 3000 years of Jewish history, that's just a blink. Um, and yeah. at the same time, there was not a day of my lifetime that I didn't think it was possible for a woman hmm. to be a rabbi. So in that way, I was very lucky. I was also lucky. My parents were married in 1969. This was just a year after Loving versus Virginia, which meant that interracial marriage was not outlawed in some of our states in America. So here my parents were um, only a year later, you know, we're getting married at a time when people were still getting accustomed to the idea of interracial marriages. And um, I was fortunate that, you know, that their love was not illegal in any state mm. by the time they got married, but only barely. Um, I was lucky that I was born at a time when um, Title IX passed and it, you know, it took a place like Yale, which had only just right before I was born a few years before started to take women mm. but you know for a while was still only wanting to keep women to about 15 percent of the college until oh, wow. title nine came around and then they were forced to have to actually go 50 50 they did not want to go there willingly so I think about these kinds of things that all contributed to this path that ultimately um, I got to be on and I, and I recognize how many shoulders I'm standing on in order to have been able to be a woman who could become a rabbi, who could have a Korean mother, who could end up leading a community. And the last thing I'd say is that the reform movement, which is the progressive movement of the Jewish community, made a decision in the late 70s that they were actually going to be welcoming of interfaith families. For a mm -hmm. long time, the policy, because it's a, it's a community that really values endogamy and Jews marrying Jews mm -hmm. for Jewish continuity's sake, um, its policy used to be, we're going to reject anyone if, uh, who marries outside of the faith. Um, if you ever saw Fiddler on the Roof, which is mm -hmm. <laughs> a yeah. lot of people's Jewish introduction, you know, they literally sit shiva. They say they say the the, the death prayer for the person who has married out. Mm -hmm. um, it was a controversial and very mm -hmm. brave decision that um, that the movement took in the '70s to say, actually, this is not good for Jewish continuity. What's going to be good for for our our community is for us to welcome those who um, marry out. So I was also coming to America just at a time when the Jewish community's attitudes were changing towards families just like mine. So all of these things contribute wow. to how I got to be where I am. And it's a confluence of, you know, gender equality issues that were just coming of age, racial 
acceptance and interfaith and interreligious and interracial couples that were just becoming um, mm. acceptable in society, just as I was um, <laughs> being born into a family that was all of those things. So um, wow. I, 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 I recognize that if I'd been born a generation earlier or even 10 years earlier, my life could not be possible as it unfolded. So I think about that a lot. Mm. And, and frankly, because I'm a person of faith, I think that there was a sense of um, this is why I'm called to be in this place mm. right now, because I could, and because I think the generations before me probably could not. Wow. I mean, that's such a helpful perspective. I mean, you know, as I'm listening to you share all those different aspects um, you know, some may say serendipity, but I mean, there's, there's so many that you just listed in terms of timing had things been five, even not even a generation earlier, but five years earlier, just all, so right. many pieces that were in place. So it's just, I think that's, it's actually very encouraging for me to hear how front and center that perspective seems to be for you. I mean, it doesn't sound like in any sense it's forgotten or you had to dig deep to pull it back up, but it's there kind of on the tip of your tongue and that you know exactly how each of these different perspectives <laughs> really well, paved you know, the way. I I will be honest with you. Um, when I got to Yale in the nineties, I was not, I would not, I would think of myself not as like a reluctant feminist, or I didn't quite understand why do we still have a women's center? Like mm. <laughs> we're, the, the job of feminism is done. I feel so naive thinking about myself that way, mm. but that was sort of the way I felt then because I, I felt like I could do anything a man could do. It wasn't mm. until I got actually a little bit older mm. or started having kids hit the glass ceiling for the first time that I actually appreciated that actually, oh, we, we still have so much work to do. In fact, if anything, I, be, I became the angry feminist in my 40s, mm. you know, wow. I but I would say the reason in part that I'm able to reflect on this now is actually I'm working on a memoir. And it's funny how you look back on these things. Mm. And suddenly, all those pieces kind of came into place. And I don't think it took some maturity, honestly, from mm. um, and some retrospection to actually think about how many sort of social movements had to, to, to lay the foundation for where I could be. Um, and it made me appreciate that fight mm -hmm. so much more. It made me realize, first of all, that we're obviously not done with any of those fights um, from feminism to racial justice, to, you know, acceptance across lines of difference and all of those things. But um, it made me appreciate that, first of all, we've made some progress, even though we have work to do. And it made me um, reflect on it in a way that I actually, frankly, when I was younger, didn't appreciate honestly yeah that makes a lot of sense and mm -hmm. i appreciate your honesty and giving that us that perspective as well which this is going to sound funny but i think is hopeful for many of us as well to feel like well there's always room for growth even as you've stated that so importantly but some of the things that you may not have realized and had to look back on that are now so fresh and and clear to you as well and again just in your story i mean there's so many important elements that are there even from the family dynamic and the empowerment you had there to some of the things and movements that were happening um, but I'm also thinking just in terms of the importance of policy. I mean, a yeah. lot of the things that you referenced were policies that were changed that had direct impact on your ability to move forward in certain circles. Um, that's something that comes up in so many different ways. I mean, I can think about that on the research side with some of the work that we're doing, for instance, around e-cigarettes and how policy can influence mm. and impact aspects of, of health when it comes to, you know, youth who may be using uh, e-cigarettes, young people or adults and all those types of, of processes, but even as you mentioned around all the diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism, how the policy can have direct impacts on people's lives. I think in a lot of different ways, sometimes we like to acknowledge that. And sometimes it seems like we pretend that that's not the case, that these right. things are just philosophical conversations when there's so much more to it as well. So, I mean, so much of what you said is resonating with me as well. And I'm, I'm attempting not to become too tangential, but I think it's just, I mean, everything you share is such a concrete example of so many ways that, that has happened in your life that has been beneficial to you as a person, as an individual who has grown and has also allowed you to have so much impact in so many ways as well. So I'm just reflecting as you're talking and kind of <laughs> piecing, piecing all those things together and appreciative again of the way that you've been able to just um, describe that and already looking forward to whatever this memoir is that you've just referenced <laughs> as well. So well, unfortunately <laughs> my day job keeps me from having a lot True. of time to write, but I've done a little more reflection. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the day job, I'm also just curious, you know, as you've taken us on this journey a little bit, how did people respond to your journey, both within the Jewish community, but the community at large? Because I can anticipate and imagine that were different responses and reactions in different circles. Um, and I'm just curious what that was like from your perspective. You know, I think that uh, 
you have to have a sense of humor about it. And I think that, um, you know, when I was younger, I mean, there wasn't a single time I could walk into a new Jewish community and not get lots and lots of questions. And, and they could come from places of genuine curiosity and, you know, welcome. And they could sometimes come from a place of challenge and ignorance and um, sometimes uh, mean spiritedness. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the, the question that I got was some variation of that's funny, you don't look Jewish, or, you know, how are you possibly Jewish or whatever mm -hmm. it was. And, um, you know, none of those things feel like massively um, uh, threatening in, in, in any sort of single instance. But if it's sort of your experience, every time you walk into a community, mm -hmm. you, f you feel constantly othered, you feel kind of constantly like you don't really belong and like a stranger. And so there was a certain aspect of that that was a defining feature of what it was like to walk into a new Jewish mm. community. Um, that being said, once I was in a community, like my home community in Tacoma, you know, it didn't take long before people um, just saw me as Angela, you know, mm -hmm. and as a Jew and as part of the community. Um, and they were open to what I could contribute and how I wanted to be a part of it. And so, I mean, I think that I, I obviously couldn't be a rabbi today if I didn't get a lot of support and love mm. and sense of meaning from people along the way, mentors, Jewish community members, like, you know, my surrogate aunties and, and mm -hmm. uncles in my con congregations who really welcomed me and were extremely loving. So, you know, I think that the good news is you get past that sort of initial, mm. um, how are you Jewish? And you know, and, and, and then you just establish yourself in a mm -hmm. way. And so mm -hmm. I would say, you know, I'm now at a stage in my career where people know who I am and I don't get the same questions. And I think I mistakenly kind of felt like, okay, well, I'm the, I'm the senior rabbi of a large Manhattan congregation with a lot of Jews of color within my congregation. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well, since I'm here at the front, it's, things are all better, right? <laughs> well, recently in light of the George Floyd um, mm -hmm. murder and just many more conversations, sort of a national reckoning that we were all having as a country around race. People in my community came out of the woodwork and shared their mm. own stories of racism within the Jewish community. And mm. I, I think I didn't appreciate <laughs> that their experience was still so much more like mine was 20 mm. years ago. And mm. it, it wasn't enough that I was the senior rabbi. There was still ways that our community was not um, responding as I kind of had hoped. And so I think you know, I ended up giving a sermon about this. Um, I knew that I, at, at kind of the most holy day of the year when I have the most people watching mm -hmm. on Yom Kippur, um, where I have thousands in my congregation watching and then hundreds of thousands watching on live stream. I knew I wanted to address racism in our country coming off of um, the summer that we'd had when George mm -hmm. Floyd was murdered. I didn't realize until I started to sit down and write the sermon that ultimately I had to start actually with what I understood was the racism that was still existent within our community. I, wow. I felt like you have to start with your own house yeah. and our own house still had work to do. And I recognize that this is a, a muscle that you have to actually exercise a muscle of fighting your biases. Um, mm -hmm. It's not usually coming. I don't, I believe people usually come from a pretty good place. I don't think most people are trying to actually make anyone feel othered or make them feel like they don't belong. They don't understand that there are questions that often come out of curiosity or ignorance. Mm -hmm ends up actually um, having that impact on people. And so I realized that I needed to talk about that first. And once you actually work on that muscle in your own community, you actually start to understand what it feels like to be more cognizant of that mm -hmm. in the rest of the world. So I, I just, I saw it as something that was really mm -hmm. important to start with the Jewish community first. And that sermon had an impact that I've never had any other sermon have. Mm -hmm. It basically kind of went viral for a sermon in the Jewish world mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that it, it was hitting at a particular time, again, timing is everything, where the community was willing to think about it and listen. And it's really shaped the conversation for our community kind of moving forward, how we're prioritizing some of these questions. And I think a sensitivity to the way that we're responding and talking to each other in, in our own community. So, you know, I now have a Jews of color group at my synagogue, which mm. is not a group that existed before. And, and I think that the idea is, we don't want to be remain separate, but we also want to have a safe space to talk about some of those things that are still challenging. And, um, you know, uh, that group, for example, wanted to have a have a meeting and talk post Buffalo about what it is to be both a person who might be black and mm -hmm. and Jewish. And there's sort of the, some of the hatred that was coming out of 
the gunman's mouth was um, both, you know, this replacement theory idea of that, that it both is rooted in deeply anti-Semitic views as well as um, anti, you know, uh, racist views um, against blacks. So I think that um, it's been really a very interesting journey um, to think about what this means. I would say that uh, I credit my community for um, absolutely for embracing me. And I think ultimately the people in our community with all of, all of its diversity. I mean, ironically, the one thing I would say is I think that when I wanted to become the senior rabbi, hmm. um, I'd already been in my congregation for eight years as the senior cantor. And so I was known in the community. And um, I don't think that it was an issue at all anymore that I was Asian, but it was very interesting that it was an issue that I was a woman um, hmm. because wow. that was the, that that was the gap for people, you know, at the time there was not another woman leading a large synagogue in, in all of New York. Like um, mm -hmm. there was, there still is not a woman in Manhattan leading a, a synagogue. That's a large synagogue. And we have, you know, a dozen of them. So I think that there is still, it's 50 years, which as I said, feels like a long time, but it's also not that long. And yeah. we just haven't quite gotten there yet. And so for them, the bigger leap was imagining a woman, in charge, they were they had become comfortable with the woman in a number two position. But I think mm -hmm. it's very different, um, and there it came out in different ways that I I felt when I was applying for that job. Um, eventually, people uh, selected me, so I, I I think that obviously it wasn't enough to for people to not kind of say we're ready to take this leap. But it's interesting how my president, who um, at the time said that as soon as it was announced, we actually happened to go to a large convention of Jews called the Biennial Gathering. Um, a week later, he said he could not believe how many people said to him, what a brave decision you made. <laughs> and he thought, wow, they're really characterizing this as like, it's brave to name wow. a, a Korean female rabbi as the head of Central Synagogue. Um, and so, you know, that just gives you a sense of where that was. That yeah. was, you know, nine years ago. Yeah. Wow. Such a, a helpful perspective, all the things you shared, and especially that last uh, last component as well. Um, but just to to go back a little bit, I mean, I'm just... I'm impressed and encouraged, one, at your willingness to lean in, in your own house, and for the ways that people seem to go along on that journey with you and really have that introspection. Because even as you were talking, I was imagining just ways that people could react in that situation. I mean, just based on all the things we've seen in so many different ways of denial or, or because like you said, even if it's not from a place of, of intentional hurt, that can sometimes put up a wall and a barrier where people don't really want to acknowledge what's there. So as much as people were willing to lean into that conversation and, you know, to you to be able to listen to what people were bringing, uh, bringing to you as well. Um, but to your last one, I think that just speaks of where things are. And again, this is me speculating, but you being in this role as a woman and people trusting you and entering into that space with you and walking through these hard topics, because obviously they are different, difficult challenges for any of us to walk through, but it seems like there's more and more layers there as they're looking to you as a leader, but also having to reconcile the fact that you are one of the few, especially in, in your area and, and, and how that has also likely had an impact. I mean, even that comment about people saying that was the brave decision, I think that's very <laughs> reflective in a lot of ways about people's perceptions. And not only like they were saying that for the, the, you know, the president and whoever was involved to make that decision, but it seems like that would also have an impact on people being willing to follow in a sense, not that they're following you, they're ultimately following God and the higher power, but you in that role as a facilitator. So again, I'm just kind of reflecting as you're sharing um, all those pieces. Uh, but one, one other question that did come to mind is just, you know, as you mentioned that there aren't other women of large uh, synagogues who are in this same type of leadership role. What has that process been like for you? I mean, is there enough, not that you don't have a cohort among your peers, but has that, is that a, uh, then we'll call it attention, but I'm, I'm just curious, I guess, how that experience has been for you. I don't, I don't want to pre-label it or presuppose, mm. but just to kind well, of give you room to comment on that as well. I guess the, the good news I would say is that it really mm. has changed even since I, I've been in this role for eight years now. So mm -hmm. since I was named nine years ago, mm. um, it is, it has changed. There's a, a you know, um, a woman was named to a large congregation in Brooklyn. And mm. then soon after, you know, up in Toronto. And so, you know, so not yet in Manhattan as many, um, although there are, I, have, I certainly have female colleagues, but of like the mm -hmm. large communities that you started to see it changing in the last, especially five years. And um, so that's also been encouraging. And I'm part of a larger rabbi cohort that studies together in Jerusalem. 
every year. And that now has a, a, like a real cadre of like um, strong women rabbis. So that's been wonderful. But I still, when I sit at tables um, and especially interfaith tables, uh, I often am still like the only woman in the room, yeah. I'm part of a religious coalition that is that is organized by the cardinal um cardinal dolan here in new york and mm -hmm. there literally were no women at that table mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and i actually opened my big mouth and said i noticed that you know this is a coalition of religious leaders you don't have a single woman sitting at this table of your executive group mm -hmm. so you open your big mouth and you get invited so i have <laughs> to course. show up now there are two of us um okay. but you know the fact is that um in many faith traditions they still do not have women in positions of religious leadership with specific kinds of titles. And so it's not just about um, uh, my own faith tradition. It's in the larger faith world and space. There are still, there are still real barriers for women, they, the stained glass ceiling, we call it. And, um, and I, you know, I think there's still a lot of work here. And the implications are not just that you're losing 50% of the potential, you know, leadership that you could have. I actually think it's even more um, dramatic than that in terms of mm. what is lost. I think mm. that people's theology is shaped mm. by the people who convey the message. Um, and it's just interesting. I mean, people, I used to grow up and say things like, oh, um, Rabbi Stern, he was a rabbi of a community that I used to lead. His voice was the voice of God. That's what I imagined God's voice to sound like, mm. right? It was Jack Stern. And believe me, he was a brilliant preacher. I could imagine God sounding like Jack Stern, but that uh, that kind of refrain of like the voice of God being their rabbi, just as the transmitter, mm. think about what that does for your conception of it. Now, what's interesting is now that I'm the senior rabbi, I don't actually think that people think that God sounds like me as much as now. I think actually they understand God in a totally different way, a little less like from on high. I think it's partly generational. I think it's partly the way women are perceived. Um, mm. And I don't want to make huge generalizations, but I think that it's shifted our theology. It's shifted our religious language. It's shifted the way we create community. It's so much deeper than just whether or not we can put women in positions. When you're talking about spiritual leadership, it actually impacts the entire way you actually think about the life of the spirit. So I think that um, it's profound, the change that's happened in 50 years since women have entered the rabbinate in our community. Yeah, yeah, that's really wonderful to hear. And it seems like it's just, like you mentioned, just perspective in a lot of ways too. Um, mm -hmm. And so many aspects of, I mean, when we think about the reflection of God in the community, it's not yeah. one or the other, it's, it's all people. So to, to hear you to speak about those things and just the practical ways you've seen that is just also, also encouraging as well. And I imagine it's having, I would imagine it's having just generational, will have generational impacts as well. I guess some of that remains to be seen, but I'm just, you know, thinking forward in that realm as well. And so definitely appreciate the way that you've brought so many of those things to light and then all the work that you're continuing to do. Cause I, I imagine it's not light work. Um, even as we have <laughs> already been talking about, um, and on that, I mean, I'm just balance is a word that I use cautiously at this point in time, but I'm wondering just to kind of move the conversation a little bit outside of your specific role, but also think about how you attempt to balance or juggle or manage as it were all the many different roles that you have and responsibilities, even in the midst of the things that continue to happen, because you talked about some of the communities that you've been involved in, in your own congregation, the groups that have started up, even the conversation you had the last few days about the situation in Buffalo. So how, how do you manage your time from that standpoint to still be able to invest and serve in your congregation, in the community, but then also to be able to have people pour into you as well? Um you know, balance, I think, what does that word mean? I think the image that comes to mind is like being on one of those like little seat of the, like those teeter totters, right? Where like you put your leg on each side and like, you know, the idea that you get to a point of balance, maybe you're like, oh, I got it. And then you're like you know, immediately back and forth. And like <laughs> yeah. the entire time, all you're doing is adjusting. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what I that's think good. my balance has been like, it's just constantly adjusting every once in a while. I can have a moment where like, ah, it's just, I'm in balance. And then, I, <laughs> then it's back. So, you know, I think um, I don't know if that's what I'm going for. I think I want to mm. be able to feel like at the end of the day, the mm. things that I have paid attention to, mm. which is ultimately going to be what my life is made up of, that those are the things that I wanted to have paid attention to. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten better about calendaring that into my life so that mm. like, I actually make sure that I calendar in, um, you know, my, you know, 
daughter's like, you know, basketball game. Mm -hmm. Um, I make, and and then if that's in there that I'm not just programming around, um, or scheduling over it, um, that I actually, you know, make sure I have time for my meditation. That is part of my own um, personal practice or, um, you know, going and exercising a little bit so I can have like mental and physical health. So I think that, you know, what I've gotten better about is scheduling that and working my life um, to make sure that those elements and sometimes it has to get canceled. Sometimes it has to get yeah. moved, but you know, it's that, that constant work. Um, one of the things I have come to understand better and it probably took till about 10 years ago when I fa- finally started doing more um, spiritual practice work and meditation is it, I used to think of things like taking care of myself. Uh, self-care has like all sorts of connotations. It can sometimes be, you know, problematic, but mm-hmm. I used to think of it as in some way sort of indulgent. Um, mm. And I went on my first sort of spiritual practice retreat with the Institute for Jewish Spirituality. I, I guess mm-hmm. it's already like 10 years ago, wow. um, five days, mostly, mostly silent meditation retreat um, and with some learning and some yoga and, and a lot of meditation. And it was like a revelation for me. It, it sort of, it sort of helped me understand that, and mm-hmm. that when I am actually not feeling in some ways whole, there's really no, I've got nothing left to give in some way. Yeah. And so I started to understand that caring for myself is a form of caring for God, uh, for caring for others. And, um, and so I don't feel as apologetic <laughs> for making mm-hmm. that time that mm-hmm. I think I used to in my younger days feel much more, much more that way. Um, it's still hard to find, find that. Yeah. And, um, and I think, you know, I think that's, that's continued work. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that as well. Cause I think so many people have started to pay much more attention to that. And it's just refreshing and encouraging to hear you stating that as a leader as well. Um, just knowing how important that time is. I mean, you know, one humorous example I always share with people is just the lack of a commute for me personally, and not realizing how much of that I use for processing when that commute turned mm. into the one minute commute from the attic matrix office back to home life and homework and all the other things that come with that realizing just feeling like things were more frazzled. And so no, Oh, that wasn't having that time was actually helpful. And I didn't realize how much I was using it to process and reset and just have balance in that sense as well. So you hear you talk about those retreats that you've taken, how important that is. And then, you know, say even thinking from a biblical reference standpoint to if our bodies are temples and are we actually yeah. taking care of our temples or just, output, output, output all the time with no care for that. So I appreciate you walking us through that as well. And the importance of scheduling. Sometimes it makes it feel, I guess, less, um, well, it is less spontaneous and less meaningful, but I think at the end of the day, like you mentioned, it's just important to have those pieces and to know that there is meaning that comes from that intentional scheduling of that basketball game for your daughter and how important that is for both of you. So right. definitely appreciate you. Taking well, I mean, and I think well. this wisdom of just the importance of some of that time I mean, that is a foundational principle of Judaism that we are actually not <laughs> yeah. meant to work um, day in, day out and create every day of the week. We actually have to take a rest. And, mm-hmm. and Shabbat is actually um, not just utilitarian so that we can rest up so we can go back and work. It's mm-hmm. actually the point of it all. Mm-hmm. And um, I would say that maybe the most profound spiritual practice of my life is that I really do make Shabbat for myself and my family. And that has sustained us, you know, even, even though, um, in my fields of work, I work on Friday nights and lead services to me, though, leading services is when I'm in the flow and I, I, mm. I find tremendous joy and it does not, that does not feel like the work of my job at all. Um, right. and, and, you know, and the Saturday morning, I'll, I often am leading services, although I'm also off some because I have a big team and we share mm. the responsibilities. So, you know, but, but Saturday afternoon, we are almost always having a long, leisurely, unencumbered Shabbat lunch um, with mm. other families, with our whole mm-hmm. family, with no electronics. And it is um, luxuriousness of um, space and time and nothing scheduled. And I think there is something about the boundaries of like, I can't do anything else, but just be that mm. actually creates tremendous freedom. And, yeah. and it is, there's such wisdom. I think if I could encourage everyone, and I don't mean just people who are Jewish, <laughs> but all people to truly feel bound to take one day um, mm. without creating or doing or feeling ambitious, but just to be, feel like this moment, I don't have to do anything, but just be with the people I love, exist, um, enjoy, take joy. I, it is life-changing, really. Yeah. yeah, I 100% agree with you and appreciate that reminder for all of us and, and the importance of it. 
Um, and again, just impressed with how disciplined, because it is discipline the way that you're talking about as well. Yes, Making it actually that takes discipline. a discipline. Yep. In some ways, I, I, you know, I didn't grow up in a tradition where I felt that that was my religious obligation. I grew up in a less kind of observant home. Mm -hmm. And I, actually, there's a part of me that was very jealous of people who felt mm. like commanded by God in that sort of traditional way to like not work. Um, and it took me a while to get to the place of recognizing that that commandedness um, was real and can come internally and you can decide to mm -hmm. take your life in that way and, um, and, and, you know, and live your life in that way. Um, so many of us feel like we don't have control over our lives that way. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think we have to push back on that. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent agree. And just the, the, the life and the freedom that comes from that. Um, and, and even just from, even from a neuroscience perspective, the expectation, we can look forward to that and have that control and just all the, all the ways that, I mean, so many aspects of what you talked about, just even being in community with one another in that space and in that time without all the outside pressures and just how beneficial, how beneficial that is for us as human beings, um, you know, as, as God's creation and just what it does to be in community. I mean, I'm trying not to pull in all the things from our previous episodes with oxytocin and community and, <laughs> and but all that is there as well. And, you know, I'll, I'll let people listen to previous episodes to really dig deep into that, but it's so refreshing in some ways, you know, even in these conversations that we have to see so many of these things come from different components from what we know from our faith traditions, from what we know and are learning from the neuroscience or psychology and to know that these things are for our benefit. And there's a reason that we should strive to keep those disciplines. I really, I love that. I kind of geek out on finding <laughs> out, you know, the science that supports the thing that religious tradition has been telling us to do all along. Yeah, I, yeah. I love that. <laughs> you know, it just kind of confirms the wonder of this, but I think it's part of it is that you have to imagine a religious tradition that has evolved over thousands of years. It's, a, it's you know, and it, I think it really truly does exist. Um, its purpose is to kind of help shape people's lives as lives mm -hmm. of meaning. Um, and value and purpose and, and also help reinforce community, which is so deeply important. I think in a time mm -hmm. when people feel more isolated than they've ever felt more, yeah. you know, lonely, um, lacking meaning and direction. Um, mm -hmm. I think that religion is the antidote. I mean, I think spirituality for me, um, it's not just about believing in God. In fact, it doesn't have to be that language, which I recognize has a lot of baggage for people. I think mm -hmm. um, maybe maybe one of the best um, explanations I've, I've heard, and I, I don't know where I heard this, so I'm sorry, I can't quote it, um, but I'll share it, is that you know the opposite of spirituality is not atheism or agnosticism. The opposite is narcissism. Mm. So if a spiritual life is really truly to help you get out of your own head, <laughs> to help you actually understand you are part of something much bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. You're part of a bigger story. You're obligated to something beyond yourself. Um, that to me is the entire purpose of what a spiritual life should be. Mm. And I think every faith tradition offers structure, ritual teachings mm -hmm. for that. Um, I think every religious tradition can be corrupted as well mm -hmm. and can be taken to extremes. But I think every faith tradition offers offers the ability for each human being to really find their purpose and to, and, and to understand themselves out of the smallness of their individual life and in the mm -hmm. context of something eternal and much bigger. Yeah. Yeah. So and well beautiful. said. Yeah. hundred percent agree. And it's, it's just, again, so refreshing and beautiful to hear you speaking about that as well. And all the ways that we, we really need to continue to, to move that conversation forward. And as you mentioned, just some part of something bigger and part of a larger community you know, how important that is for so many of us, especially, you know, even as we let off this conversation, just saying that we have seen aspects of ways communities have come together in the midst of the challenges that we're facing and ways that it was more difficult for us to do that when we were in isolation. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I'm hoping that we hold on to those aspects and we don't forget those things, you know, as we are, you know, back in society in a sense or emerging or re-emerging or whatever state people are in because there's a whole range of different states that people are walking through that, but I think it's such an important thing for us to be able to hold on to um, in so many ways. And also this makes me think of unity, the importance of unity. I mean, especially, you know, I know I keep harping back to what happened in the past, you know, in the past week, but it's been, I think, an opportunity for us to have unity. I've even seen, you know, some things on social media just talking about, well, opportunities for those in Jewish communities and black and brown communities and other communities to come together around some of these Unfortunately, mm -hmm. common tragic situations that many of us are walking through, especially, you know, even in, 
Asian American and Pacific Islander communities and the diversity that that community has, but what are the ways that we can kind of move together in union to make sure that these things um, are addressed head on, even as you've talked about in your own congregation. So I know that's different than what we've been saying, but that still comes to mind when I think about these aspects of community. And I think about these aspects of having discipline to sit down and to pause and to rest and refresh and just be in the presence of one another. Um, so again, it just, it makes me think that this is just full circle in a lot of ways. Um, at the same time, even as you're talking about some of these disciplines, and I know that there are often things that do come up. I mean, situations come up that throw us from that disciplined hmm. arena. We have to have, you know, margins for flexibility and adjustments for impromptu conversations and those types of things. So I was going to have you share about how that happens in your life um, as well, but also just want to highlight for those who don't know, you know, a very specific situation where that happened for you um, back in hmm. January when you received a call from a, a gunman who had congregants um, in a hostage situation um, in Texas and how you responded to that situation in a very quick thinking manner. Um, so I wonder if you just, as much as you want to kind of take us through that and what you learned um, in that moment, because again, obviously something that wasn't planned, that didn't fit into your normal routine, but that you had to respond to. And also I would imagine to decide how urgent is this in actuality? Well, I, I received a voicemail on Shabbat afternoon after services from a rabbi who let me know that he was being held hostage with three others um, by a gunman who was, had, had bombs and had a gun and was threatening their lives. And, um, and he asked for me to call them back. Um, it took me uh, a few moments to, to even figure out if this was real. Mm -hmm. um, you know, did a quick Google search, tried to see if there was anything in the news yet, which there wasn't at that point. Um, but realized very quickly, I needed to actually call this person back. Um, uh, the rabbi picked up the phone and then quickly passed the phone to the gunman who um, I, I realized very quickly, this was not a crank call, that this mm. was real and, and, um, and terrifying. And essentially the gunman, um, took hold of a, a really age old anti-Semitic trope that Jews kind of basically control uh, government and control mm. others and are, have, you know, outsized influence, this sort of kind of conspiracy theory model of Jewish power. And um, he called me, um, he had done some internet research because I, maybe because I lead Central Synagogue and Central sounds like it's sort of the center. He, he's from England and he, there in England, they have a chief rabbi. I think he was looking for the equivalent. Mm. And um, he saw a picture of me when I went to the White House pictured with Obama. So he was like, you, you know, the president, you know, Obama. Um, honestly, I'm not really sure why he picked me, mm. but he believed, he believed that I could free um, a person he called his sister, although she wasn't his sister, but who, uh, uh, a terrorist who had been convicted and was sitting in a federal prison 20 minutes from that synagogue in Texas. Mm. And so he basically gave me an hour to wow. free her and bring her to the synagogue. And he said, if you do that, then, then everyone can stay safe. And if you don't, well, I have a bomb strapped in my backpack and I've got bombs in New York and I have bombs in Brooklyn. Um, wasn't sure about the bombs in New York and Brooklyn, but I was quite certain that this man had a gun and probably a bomb with him and that he, he was prepared to die. That was very clear. Mm. He said that he said that on the phone several times. Wow. I love death more than you love life. Wow. And um, I mean, it was a, it was a surreal, um, you know, um, terrifying responsibility. Um, I, I felt completely responsible for these four mm. people's lives. Um, even as I knew in my mind that I was mostly powerless to do anything. Like the, 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 the little that I could control was buying some time, um, hoping to keep him calm, ass making assurances until someone could come and save them, mm -hmm. which I thought could be quickly because I quick, because I had already heard that police were on the scene there. Mm. Um, you know, as, as the, as the situation unfolded, it took 11 hours before, um, the terror, they actually freed themselves with the rabbi throwing a chair at the terror, at the gunman and running out the door. And, 
um, you know, and the FBI coming in and, and ultimately um, killing the gunman. So it was, it was a really um, unreal situation. I think that uh, it, it made, I think every Jew around the world um, felt that they were held hostage for those 11 hours mm. with them. I mean, we were watching in a way from Israel to France mm. to everywhere in America. Um, I think it was, and I, and I think that many Americans, you didn't have to be Jewish to feel mm -hmm. the terror of that, um, the horror of, of um, his demands. And, you know, it was, I think he, I think it's pretty clear there's a man who suffered from some mental illness, which his family concurred, but he mm. was spouting out like anti-Semitic trope, which he had learned and which mm. is too much in, you know, not just in the air, but too mm. much in the news. Even it's, yeah. it's been mainstreamed, these ideas. And yeah. that was part of what was so frightening. Um, you know, I think I felt personally very vulnerable in those, in those moments. Um, certainly not as much as the four that were being held hostage, but, um, you know, and I think that we're still processing what it means, I think, to, to live in a world, which is like that. And, 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 you know, some of that same kind of anti-Semitism, um, which fuels white supremacy is some of the stuff that is being spouted by, uh, the gunman from Buffalo that like, you know, I think for us to think that that kind of rhetoric, um, doesn't turn violent, um, you know, is to not look at history and to not be honest with ourselves. So this has to be the kind of thing that is, um, you know, not just, it has to be uh, wiped out yeah. Im immediately upon hearing. And, and I yeah. think there's been way too much acceptance of this kind mm -hmm. of rhetoric and under the guise of sort of free speech. I think it's, I think it's very threatening. Yeah. Well, first of all, I just appreciate you taking us through that as well. Obviously that was a difficult situation while it was happening, I imagine not necessarily easy to kind of walk through it again, but just to want to acknowledge that first all of all, but then also just to, to thank you for just sharing the important lessons with us as well, especially as you've talked about the rhetoric, rhetoric um, because it, again, it is so has so many practical outputs and outcomes, even in the same way that we talked about on the other side, just the impactfulness of the policies that allowed you to walk into the role that you are in a lot of ways now, but on the other side, the power of the rhetoric that can do the complete opposite and lead to loss of life. So, I mean, I think it's really important and healthy for us to kind of hold both of those together and just to think about ways that we can continue to move forward. Um, so I know appreciate you, you know, being willing to go to that level and just all that you did in that situation as well. I mean, just the, the, the quick thinking and well, having to I mean, process and, and navigate simultaneously is not an easy place to be. Yeah. Well, I mean, but part of what you're lifting up, which I think is a thread that I hadn't really thought about as much is just, we often think of any of these situations, whether it's me being kind of like, oh, look, there's like the first Asian rabbi and she's a woman. And it's sort of like, almost like an, like an unusual case. Mm -hmm. um, and, and on the flip side, it's sort of the negative. You, you, you take someone like this gunman, you say, he's mm -hmm. like a lone wolf. He's this crazy one singular person who does this. What we actually often ignore are the systemic underpinnings that allow either the exactly. kind of maybe exceptional case in a good way or the exceptional case in a dangerous violent way that there yeah. it's almost no one is a lone wolf there are there are um systems and um and biases and tropes and all sorts of stuff that kind of like inform a person that gets mm -hmm. gets them to that place so i think that mm -hmm. with the buffalo shooter with this gunman he, he acted alone perhaps in that moment, but he did not come to his views, which were so dangerous. I mean, both of those guys were absolutely premeditating their acts. Mm -hmm. you know, one drove 200 miles to the grocery store. This one came all the way from England and bought an airplane ticket and mm -hmm. worked his way down to that specific synagogue that was the closest synagogue he could find to the prison um, that he wanted to free the prisoner from. So like it was highly premeditated. Mm -hmm. So even if it was singular, there was a whole structure around him thinking that this was what he had to do. He didn't go to the church that was close to that federal prison. He went to the synagogue for a very specific reason. So I think that like those kinds of things that we have to think about, and it, it can happen in the positive way too, that yeah. you can have um, cases that come up. But I know that I was supported by a whole structure of policies and mm -hmm. mentors and um, communities that sort of like taught me and helped me understand what was possible and, and then, and then enabled all those things to be possible. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, anyway, those yeah, things matter. That's really well said. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm in a sense, it puts onus of all of us yes. as members of our communities to think about the influence that we have 
with every single person around us. I mean, I often talk about that if I'm giving a talk around mental health advocacy. So I think we don't often all think about ourselves as influencers because that reward has been <laughs> so misused. Corrupted, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if I want to go there, but at the same time, I often try and challenge people to think about, well, who are the people immediately around you and how do they react when you talk about specific things? So obviously I'm, I'm oftenly painting that in terms of mental health, but how do you talk about mental health? Do you talk about it pejoratively? And is that rub off on those around you? Do they, do they also talk about it that way so that when someone now runs into a mental health challenge, it's seen as completely negative because that's the culture and the atmosphere right. that we've talked about that in. And I think you're saying that in the same way as well. Versus do we talk about things in ways that are hopeful or informed by, by truth and healing and, and opportunities for community because all that will have effects. And sometimes, I mean, that can be two ways to think about all the time. But I think we're oftentimes ignore that. I mean, myself, I can think about that as well. We often ignore that. And we just need to pay that much more attention to it to think about all the lives that we're influencing around us because it will have these larger implications. And I think, you know, everything that you shared on both sides has, has really highlighted that as well. Yeah. So a lot, a lot for us to, a lot for us to think about. Um, and again, just, I guess I'm feeling also at the same time, it's, it's a challenge because I feel grateful and then also a weight of responsibility. And in a sense, I'm grateful <laughs> because I feel like, and this is, this is going to sound like self-promotion, but just the ways we've been able to do that on this podcast with so many people who have been able to share the ways that they were having impact locally, you know, in their families and their communities, but then also on much larger scales and nationally as well. And just as much as we can continue to elevate both the small and the big things that are happening, I think are just so important for us. And I feel like you've been doing that in this conversation too, just even in the way I keep going back to um, the things that you mentioned about the Shabbat and just the community, the peace that's there. I mean, I almost, in a sense, and this is my, sorry, it's my addiction related research coming out again, but I feel like I have a craving <laughs> for that type mm -hmm. of atmosphere and that environment and thinking about ways to be more proactive about trying to include aspects of that um, in my own life because that it's easy for that to slip without that discipline and dedication as well so again a lot of full circle moments that i'm having in this conversation i'm just reflecting on many of the things that you're sharing as well um, yeah i did also just want to end just talking a little bit about hope because we've alluded to it a lot as we've been going through the conversation you've talked about things that have been giving you hope even in your role and in amongst your congregants but I'm curious just what that word means to you on a day-to-day -day basis um, in the midst of everything that we experience and in the midst of everything that you do. Well, um, I ended my sermon the week after Colleyville um, sharing a, a blessing that is part of our tradition. And it is a blessing that we say before we read from the book of Lamentations, mm. Lamentations that may be the saddest book of the Bible. Um, and it's about Jerusalem being sacked and destroyed. It's used imagery of like a woman that's soiled. It's like a, it's a terrible, um, terribly horrible piece. And it, mm. it is read before the ninth day of the month of Av, which is the day of the destruction of not only the first temple, but also the second temple. And then just as the way that kind of like, I don't know, religious coincidence works, like many other horrible things that have ever happened to the Jewish people have happened on the ninth day of Av. So it's, it's kind of a day mm. of a national day of mourning, um, historic and current. And we read that book of Lamentations mm. on this horrible day, thinking about all the terrible things that have happened to the Jews. Mm. And we, before we read that book of Lamentations, we say a blessing, um, at least in my community. And we say that we are asire tikva, we are captives of hope. Mm. Like, it's such, a, such wow. an amazing phrase captive when you're captive to something it's almost like you're being held against your will <laughs> mm -hmm. and despite yourself and I, I there are times when it's very easy for me to feel very hopeful um I, I'm a generally optimistic person and then there are times where I feel like it's actually impossible mm -hmm. and yet I'm I'm a captive of hope I, I think that that is what we're called to be in a sense. Um, the text I think is originally from Jeremiah, but that phrase, but this idea that we, um, we have no choice um, but to be held to that expectation and we cannot give in to the kind of the fashion of the day to despair. Mm. Um, we can't afford that. So I think that that's, that's my general take. Sometimes it comes more easily than others. Yeah, well, I love that phrase and I'm definitely going to carry that with me out of this conversation, hopefully keep that in my, in my spirit, so to speak. So 
again, appreciate I sense everything. You're, you're, a, you're a kindred co- uh, captive <laughs> of hope. Me. I will take that. I will definitely mm-hmm. take that. Um, and I, I, I think that it's true in a lot of ways. And honestly, it's been, you know, having people like you on this podcast has been a general reminder of that. And as people have shared their reasons for hope and the ways that they've seen things move, the ways that people have uh, allowed them to remain in that place. And so I definitely, definitely take that and uh, accept that as well. So, well, again, on that note, just want to thank you for taking the time, especially with all the responsibilities, the role that you have and the things that you continue to do. I really appreciate one that we were able to be connected through Dr. Chu and two that you uh, took up that offer to connect and just talk through this conversation. And we've touched on so many important things. Um, And I I do say this every once in a while, but this is one of those conversations I know I'm just going to have to go back and listen to and just pull out so many different pieces and reminders that we've had along this conversation. So definitely appreciate you being here and joining on the Addy Hour. I know the listeners are going to get a lot out of this conversation as well. Thank you so much for having me. Of course.